So good morning and welcome everybody to the second day of the Young Researchers Workshop on Machine Learning for Materials. Thank you for joining both in presence and online. Uh, this first morning session will be a tutorial session that will take place on Google Colab. So you will find on the conference website, ml4m.xyz, the link to the first Google Colab. So presenting today is Anton Bushkarev from ICAMS. Uh, and he is a researcher working on uh, atomic cluster expansion representations and their applications to machine learning potentials. Uh, without further ado, I give you the word. If you need any help, uh, reach out to me or the other organizers. We will try to help you as much as we can with the running and uh, uh, using the collab. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the introduction and hello, good morning, everyone. So yeah, just I'm Anton Bachkarov. I'm from ICAMS at Germany. So without too much of an introduction, let's immediately go to and see what we have. First, before we start anything uh, at the call up, please go to this uh, runtime uh, tab and click this change runtime type and make sure that you have the GPU selected here. And if you do, it's fine. Just get out of there. If it's not, just change it to it and proceed. Uh, we, we would need to install a few things. Uh, I try to make it as package independent as possible, but we would need to install a couple of, of packages like Atomic Simulation, Warm and Pandas. And also closer to the end of the lecture, we would talk about the Atomic Cluster expansion. So we would have to install a couple of tools that we develop and uh, they are installed here. You have to copy some uh, repositories from Git for the Python A's and the tensor potential for running the fitting. All of this is set up to just run all of these uh, uh, windows here. Just after you run all of them, there would there is would appear the, the button to restart the runtime. So please click it and it will restart. And after that, do not execute it again and just go directly here and start the, 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 the importing. Uh, that's to the technical details. I won't run any of this. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the something that is called structural descriptors. What are they and what are they needed for? What are they supposed to do? And what we want from them? And we I mean those who want to find their represent basically do the machine learning potentials. So basically, what's the problem and uh, that we want to solve? So here, usually what we do is that we have some structure that is represented by the coordinates and atomic types, and we solve a, uh, some Hamiltonian and minimizing for the wave functions, we can produce the energy. So basically solving quantum mechanical equations. Uh, that's in a, in a perfect case, but it is expensive method. So we want to replace them. And exactly we want to replace them with something, with some function, some generic function that is uh, but preferably cheaper to execute than the compute the quantum mechanical Hamiltonian that would also be dependent somehow on the same uh, configurations and also some parameters of that function or model and uh, minimizing with respect to these parameters of that model, we would produce some energy that would hopefully be closer to, to the true one. And minimization of these parameters is carried out through minimizing some loss function that usually take a uh, form which is similar to this. So you, yeah, basically the the root mean square difference between the the true energy and the one produced by the model minimization with respect to the parameters. So we're not gonna talk about this part too much. That concerns the minimization algorithm. That concerns exactly what are what is the function here and there are multiple methods of, of of regression basically what we mostly gonna talk about about this part about the structural representation of our structures 
So let's just then take some structure, for example, acetyl-aldehyde molecule here, which looks like this, two carbon atom, one oxygen, four hydrogen. And uh, uh, just how can we basically do this? Just take the coordinates of the structures and, and do some functions, or can we just actually do this? Just take the coordinates, like that would be just the matrix like this here, uh, assign the, the types of the atoms somehow and put this generic function and try to learn the energy. In principle, it's actually possible. And it, I think people just have tried to do it at, at the beginning of all these machine learning activities. And the thing is that you, it, you can be to a certain degree successful with this. You can actually learn some energy from just the Cartesian coordinates of the, of the atoms. The problem is that, that you would have to have a massive amount of data for just even this particular simple system to do it. And why is that? Is that because if you just rotate at this molecule and that we do by simply executing this command, providing the degree of rotation and the axis of rotation here, and look at these positions again, they are changed almost completely except of the z axis because we're rotating around it and but we know that the molecule didn't change so we want to have the the same energy for this rotated molecule and still you can sort of fix it you can just add to your data rotated molecules with exactly the same uh, energy and just hope that your generic function would learn this uh, rotational invariance of your system. The same thing happen if you just rearrange uh, the indices of the atoms or just the orders of the atom coordinates in this list. So doing nothing by this, we just have some array of indices, we just shuffle it and then we uh, here just rearrange the according to this mixed uh, indices and look at the positions again, they are totally different order compared to the previous one, but we didn't do anything. We just relabeled the atoms. And again, we have totally different representation. So this is not particularly convenient. And I, I, I just stress on this because it's not convenient. This is, doesn't mean that it's just again impossible to do just this. Uh, it's just that it, it would uh, require a massive amount of data. It will require the complexity of your generic function, say the neural network, that it would learn all of this that you want. And it's just not very practical, not very efficient. So what you want in particular is that take your um, atomic coordinates and types and take yet another function that would somehow uh, represent this uh, this in a, some different way, including some domain knowledge of yours. And uh, because of the different domains, that representations could be different and that sort of also important. But in general, what's the domain knowledge here is just physics. And, and most of the thing is what the requirements to this function here that are usually called descriptor. Uh, the, the main requirements are most that we just said that would be the rotational and translational variance because we know that the, the energy of the system do not change upon this uh, transformation. Also, we want it to be permutation and inversion invariance, invariant and preferably size independent. Say preferably because uh, size independence is not a physical requirement really, it's a technical requirement. And physical model can be perfectly size dependent. And it would be kind of naturally that the, the property of the system depend on how many atoms it can, it can consist of. But uh, for it modeling applications, because again, we kind of talk about all of this in the context that we want to do some simulations for with the structures, uh, fast and efficient, long time, low, large scale simulations. So we want that all our representations that we do are actually size independent so we can scale up like computing not a single molecule, but say the, the hundreds of these molecules or in, this molecule incorporated in some, something else, but such that it 
still that wouldn't affect this representation. So now let's take a look at some a couple of simple examples and historically one of the first examples of the structural descriptors. And uh, one of them is the, the so called column matrix. So definition is, is right here. So basically you take your atoms and uh, you construct a square matrix, diagonal elements of this matrix would be just uh, the atomic number of, of an atom in some power. And then all diagonal elements would represent the interaction of these atoms with all the other atoms in the system and scaled by the distance between the atoms. So couldn't be more simple than that. Now, then the energy of, of our system state would be some function that depends on this. So here we just build a function that would construct for us the, the column matrix given the, the atomic structure. So here we just take as an input atoms for further experiments, we allow this uh, function to, to, to accept a couple of arguments, whether we want to kind of per permute the atomic position, so we want to rotate it. So here we just get the number of atoms that in our structure. So if permute is true, we arrange atomic indices. If the rotate is true, we rotate it again, some degree. And here we construct the, the uh, the column matrix. That's not the best way of doing because this matrix is obviously symmetric. So in principle, you could just compute the only the upper part and then mirror it and all the other stuff. But here, okay. Is it better? Try to make it bigger, you know. Okay. Is everyone can see? Okay, good. All right. Back to column matrix. So again, this particular algorithm is not necessarily the most efficient one, but we just want to kind of uh, explicitly see what we're doing here and just to build it. So we go around the all our atoms and the basically all, all the elements in the matrix. We take the uh, atomic numbers of a particular indices here that we list and we take the positions and we compute the distances between the atoms. And so if the indices are not the same, so we compute the old diagonal element uh, and if it's the same, so it's just a diagonal, we take the atomic number uh, the, the atomic number of this atom and perform this. And we then return our matrix here. So we write this into the particular element of the matrix. Well, and by the way, why I'm saying this, I'm just assuming that everyone is somehow of, of kind of familiar with Python and how it works and, and all the indexing and stuff. Are everyone actually aware? If not, raise a hand. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's our function. Let's take back our molecule and try to build this for this molecule. So what we expected exactly the di the square matrix here. Uh, because it's symmetric again, doesn't matter with either, either rows or columns. They would just represent an interactions or some some sort of interactions of a particular atom. So the first one would be oxygen, first with itself, then with carbon, hydrogen, another carbon, and another three hydrogens. So that, that's basically it. That's the matrix of numbers. More or less what we expected now. So let's check if it's rotational invariant and uh, be, do exactly the same, but now this time set the rotate true and see. And as you can see, the matrix did not change at all. It's all the same elements in all the same places here. So that at least one of the requirements that we want to have for the descriptor is fulfilled. But now what happens if we 
permute the positions of the atoms. And now the matrix is, looks totally different. It's all the same numbers, but they are in different places. So the problem is, is we want the, it, it is technically required that this uh, representation wouldn't change upon such operations, because then attaching some learning machinery uh, to this some function that would actually produce energy out of this descriptor, this representation should always come into exactly the same uh, way. Otherwise, it wouldn't distinguish whether there's something changed with the structure or it's just uh, it's the same structure, but you did something to it. So it, it's very simple uh, descriptor and it appears to be kind of almost working. So can we somehow uh, lift this uh, small restriction here? And one of the, and there are actually many ways of doing this. There are not a unique way of doing something. And that I guess I will also repeat a few times during the, the tutorial that there are there is a lots of arbitrarities in the in the machine learning in particular and all these representations and machine learning potentials uh, because there are only the this uh, few physical requirements that you want to have from uh, your representation, but you can come up with multiple numbers of ways of how you do it exactly. And here we would see two or three of them, but there are many more. And, uh, and even here, having this representation and having the fact that it's not permutationally invariant, how you deal about that. And there is, again, there is not a unique way of doing this. For example, you can just sort this matrix itself and use the matrix as a, as a descriptor directly. Or some other ways, for example, is just to compute the eigenvalues of this matrix and then sort them according to the, the values of the, uh, the magnitude of the eigenvalue, basically. And if we do this for all the three matrices that we produced, we will get the list, the list of exactly the same numbers in exactly the same order. So even though the matrix itself changes upon the permutation, the eigenvalues don't. And uh, the only thing we just have to make sure that we uh, arrange those eigenvalues in the same way, regardless of, of, of which comes first. And that this one would be a suitable descriptor for do some learning to do, to assign the energy to it with some particular methods. Uh, usually, with the column matrix is done with the kernel methods, and I guess you were there, there was a lecture yesterday about that, and the tutorial is coming after this about the kernel methods. So. Here, we're not talking about the methods of how you learn from that descriptor the energy, but rather just the representation itself. The other variations of these methods uh, for the periodic systems, because obviously the, uh, you cannot do it so easily if you have periodic boundary conditions, but there are ways of how to do it. And basically it doesn't become more complicated than that. It's just accounts for the, for the distances of the atoms that you have in your code, the, the, the atomic distance that enters the column matrix here. It just compute to take it by taking care of the periodic boundary conditions. And that's basically it. Uh, so what are the advantages of, of this particular representation? It is very simple and arguably couldn't be more simple than that. You just literally have atomic numbers and positions as a descriptor and that's it. Uh, and it's also global, meaning that uh, you, your descriptor, has the information of the entire structure. All the atoms interact with all the atoms. You have information uh, directly or indirectly about all the interactions or of every atom with every atom. And, and in principle, this is something that you want to have. So that, that's a plus. But then again, the minus is, is that it is simple. And that means that potentially there would be some interactions that this descriptor just cannot uh, capture. 
simply because there is something more going on rather than just uh, positions and, uh, and numbers and you have to have some additional degree of freedom that would allow to account for this. And, and this is again the opposite of the this globality of this descriptor is that it is size dependent. So here, even though this array of, of, of numbers, uh, it would be exactly the same order for exactly the same uh, for the same molecules or even for the molecule for the same size, it would be the same. And then you could learn the differences between the molecules. But the num the, the amount of numbers that you have here. It would change if the size of the molecule would change. Here we have what seven, and then would be ten atoms. You only have ten, and that is a restriction actually, and big inconvenience uh, from multiple ways. First, then preparing your data, you have to assume a maximum size that you have, and all your descriptors should be of a maximum size, regardless if they have this number of atoms or not. Uh, you would have to insert something, or well, usually zeros, that they account that this particular molecule, for example, doesn't have so many atoms as the other half. And also, it means that it doesn't really scale that good. If you want to do such a descriptor for structure of a few thousands of atoms, that would mean you would have a, a matrix of a few thousand, few thousand. So the computational the cost of this method would scale quadratically with the number of atoms. And the whole point of having this, this uh, machine learning potential, something is to have a linear scalability with the number of particles in the system. Um, it doesn't mean that it's particularly bad or something. It's again about the domain uh, of application and uh, what exactly you want to have. I put here a few links that you can take a look for further more thorough um, study on the topic and it's uh, as far as i know very successful method for for its domain of application basically so now the let's move to the other type of the descriptor so the size dependency so it is crucial if we want to have if we want to simulate with our method systems that are of size of several thousands of atoms or more. So the the classical way of doing this, and that's the, the way of doing this from uh, the classical empirical potentials, is to say that your total energy of a system is a sum of the atomic energies. Uh, and that's already puts us in a lot of troubles because this is a very ill-defined problem simply because there are infinite number of, of ways that you could fulfill these requirements and uh, the fact that there are that we are talking about the structural descriptors and not the they descriptor is already kind of showing this this arbitrarity here that there is multiples and close to infinite ways of, of doing this and uh, with that, still, it allows us to kind of to, to separate the energy into uh, individual contribution. And now instead of writing some uh, function that would describe the total energy of a system, we would write the function that would describe uh, energy of a, a given atom. And now, since while just discussing it and we haven't even done anything yet, we have to write now the, 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 our generic function that would take uh, and an input and descriptor and immediately something, some other function, uh, which would depend on some distance here, R, RC. How this distance appears here and why is it appearing here? So this is simply by these requirements of, of that we just did here. If we want this sum, kind of to make sense, we have to limit our, um, our energy of a particular atom to some local environment. So we have to limit it in space somehow, otherwise we're just having a global descriptor again, then there is no reason to actually do this separation. So we have to put a limit. And then since we have to put it, so it have to appear here. 
And so usually how it's done, so you have a, your central atom and you uh, draw a circle around at the distance of RC and it's, we call the cutoff distance. And everything that is inside this cutoff distance is uh, contributing to the energy of the central atom here. Everything is, which is outside does not. And that would be the, this local atomic environment. And introducing of this cutoff distance immediately also uh, requires us to introduce a cutoff function. And the, the role of this cutoff function is make sure that the basically the continuity of, of your energy uh, surface. This is simply because if you don't have it, at any point of time, some atom which is outside of this cutoff distance can get into your cutoff. And then it would, uh, would introduce a stepwise change into your energy. And that would mean a discontinu discontinuity in this uh, kind of uh, first derivative, so you have troubles with forces and all the other stuff. So we want to avoid this. And so whatever happens by introducing yet additional or removing an atom from the local environment, whatever changes happen, you want these changes to be smooth. Whether they are large or big, they have to be smooth. And also you kind of want that uh, if the atom is very far, it obviously should, well, not obviously, but intuitively, it should contribute less to the energy of this atom rather than those which are closer to it. So you contribute, you have to introduce a cutoff function that would take care of this. And for this particular example, we take a look at such cutoff function, uh, which has a cosine that decays with the cosine from one to zero, going from the distances which are smaller than RC. So starting from zero to RC decays like this. And if it's just outside the cutoff distance is simply zero. So it does exactly what we just, what they just described. So let's take a look at this function, how it looks like, and we can just implement it simply here by the function that takes two arguments, the, the distance, this one, but that would be the atomic distance, and then the cutoff distance, and then we simply do this. And uh, everything that is bigger than RC, we just say that it's gonna be zero. And uh, let's now set the cutoff to be 10. Let's span our distances from zero to something slightly bigger than 10 and just draw the function. Doesn't quite fit into the screen, but this is basically the idea. So it smoothly goes from something to zero and everything that is outside this function is zero and everything that goes in is slightly and smoothly starts to contribute to, to the total value here. Okay, there are again multiple ways of doing the cutoff functions. Some of them don't decay immediately, they are just one all the way, and then closer to cutoff, they start to rapidly decay. And the, that's all possible all the different functionals for, for functional form of this cutoff functions are possible, polynomial functions or something. And that's again uh, to the argument about the arbitrarity, certain degree of arbitrarity of the things that we do. And um, so now with the cutoff function, uh, we take a look at the structure or descriptor that's called that atom-centered symmetry functions. And the idea of this uh, descriptor is that by just taking this um, interatomic distances, so, oh, let me formulate another way. So imagine then you would have a structure again, say the other molecule that we've seen the other time, and it has a set of interatomic distances that are present there. So some atom is distanced from the other, on a particular uh, distances. And then you have, for, for all the, these atoms, you would have the, the list of such distances here, Rj. And then say, now, since we are moved to talking about the, 
local picture, we are mostly going to talk about all the time about the descriptor or the energy of a particular central atom I. And so for this central atom I, so you would have this, uh, you would have a several neighbors and J neighbors. And for each of them, you would have a distance. What you can do is then to take a Gaussian function or some, some probe basically at distance RS and see if your um, local environment of this atom has a distance that it is located here. So th these functions are basically nothing but a probe at some distance that you put and check if there is a distance like this or not. And this parameter at here determines how wide your probe is. So, and then the, the cutoff function comes in. So let us just see how it looks like. And I guess it would be more clear from there. We implement this uh, descriptor here. Again, and the input goes the interatomic distance, the parameter eta, the pro position, and the cutoff radius. Uh, so basically, this is nothing but exactly this function, this formula implemented here exponent eta, interatomic distance minus the pro position squared, and the cutoff function that we just implemented before. So uh, let's choose the cutoff to be 10 again our eta parameter and the positions, or oh, let's just first take a look at the sum range of the interatomic distances that would range from zero to, to our cutoff. And the, let's do a several probes at the uh, positions that also range from zero to um, cutoff distance and just try to plot it. So that's basically exactly how it looks like. At some position RS, you would have a Gaussian peak of width determined by the parameter at them. And that's basically uh, what you're doing by applying this function. You probe the, the space here, um, this one atomic environment. You basically insert the probe, say, at some distance RS, and say, if there is an atom around here. And if it is, you would get from this peak some values, whether it's how, how close is it to, to your uh, probe position, you would get a value, which is higher or lower. And that would be your descriptor. Let's basically see how the eta parameter would influence the our peaks. So the smaller the eta, the wider the the the, the probe width. Sorry. So varying these parameters, you can adjust and the precision of, of how, uh, how or precision of your face uh, space probing. Uh, then you can even, if you take it even smaller, say one, then the peaks would start to overlap. And then uh, even this, let's say the distance five, even if you don't have a, an atoms, which are five angstroms from each other, but let's say four, you would still get a contribution from that probe to your um, descriptor. And then uh, the descriptor itself would be the sum of uh, across the neighbors uh, of these probe functions. And then you can select several of those probes like here and say that I would probe different uh, places in my um, local atomic environment and uh, for, for each of this probe and for each neighbor that hits the probe, I would just accumulate them and see uh, how it looks. So yeah, we can also take a look at how the width changes with the at a parameter like this. So basically the, the smaller the parameter, the wider the peak. This is yeah the so-called the hyperparameter of a model. So, um, I'll come back to it later a little bit. 
So let's just then uh, build this descriptor for particular crystal structures and just see how it looks for, uh, say, for BCC and FCC uh, lattice. So we're doing this by, again, uh, introducing these functions. We pass in the atomic structure. We would build the several of these descriptors. And uh, here we pass the positions of our probes. And we put the eta parameter and the cutoff parameter. So first, what we do, we should build a neighbor list. That is something that for each atom in our structure, we should construct this list of the neighbors that it has. And that is just the function that does it. Nothing really to do here. Uh, it's probably just something uh, to explain that, that. Well, basically, that's the cutoff that we have here in a particular form. Um, this parameter so might be uh, important here. So the self-interaction means that we exclude the atom itself from this neighbor list because the, the, the our descriptor only you can, for this, this the description of a local atomic environment, we probe how this given central atom interacts with this environment. We don't consider self-interaction in a way. So we have to exclude this one. And here both ways means that we, uh, if the, say the atom J is the neighbor of an atom I, then also for the number, for the atom J, I would be a neighbor as well. Because again, for each of the atom in the structure, we have to build this, this full environment because our descriptor is described, the kind of depends on this full, full circle around the atom. Uh, in say in the classical and some of the classical atomic potentials, you depend on the kind of the total number of pair distances, and you would say this to false simply that that would mean that if a J if it's a neighbor of an atom I, then I wouldn't be a neighbor of a J already because you counted this distance already, and that would be so called half neighbor list, and for this one we need a full neighbor list. So we do that. Then let's. Then here we're preparing the list of our G two descriptors, and uh, for that we're gonna fill now. And then for all the atoms in our structure, we go, um, we iterate and get the neighbors of of a particular atom I. Here it returns the indices of 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 the neighbors of these atoms. So in the list of the positions, the indices would be the position of the atoms in this list. And then the offsets here, that's a uh, offset vector, which takes into account the periodic boundary condition. So if the neighbors of the atom is actually located in a different cell, the offset vector would account for this. So in this index would return you an index of an atom in, the, in your real cell and the offset will tell you if this atom is actually in this cell or in the periodic image of this cell. And because of that, now here we compute their interatomic distances. So we take uh, here the distance of our central atom and we repeat it as many times as it has neighbors. So just to compute all the distances at once. And then exactly for the neighbors, we take the positions uh, of our neighbors in the real cell, and then add the, the offset distance. Here, this symbol is a matrix multiplication, so offset is a vector, and the atom cell is the, the, cell, the, uh, the cell of the system. Multiplying by this, you produce this displacement vector from the position in the real cell to the periodic image. And then you just compute the interatomic distance and take a norm of it. And uh, here, yep. Uh, so we do exactly this. We our previously defined G radio function that computes our descriptors. We pass in this distance that we just compute the eta parameter, the probes, and the probes are in the list of our RS, RS list that we provide later. And we sum uh, amongst the, across the neighbors of a central atom. 
and append the list and then return it in the end. So let's set up a couple of constants here. So ng would be the number of here of our G descriptors that are we gonna produce. RC is the cutoff. And so the RS list, exactly this, this list here, would we just choose it something that ranges from one angstrom to RC minus 0, 05 simply. So just not to take it exactly at RC because it would be zero by the definition of the cutoff function. And we take the ng of those and just set some random eta parameter. So let's then build an FCC copper structure and set the lattice parameters to I don't know, some arbitrary number, say four, and build our G2 descriptors for it and plot it. So this is how they look like. Something funny, but that's just basically, we, we would further uh, later try something else and we will see more clearly what it is, but just for the moment, some descriptor. So basically that's uh, what was supposed to do. It just gives you some information that uh, that's says basically that at some distance, say three angstrom, your atomic density would correspond to something like this. But I mean, I connected the dots here, but in reality, you only have exactly this number of dots. So you have the information that your structure has such this density of neighbors. So you, your uh, atomic environment rather uh, has some density at this distance. Uh, it does not necessarily mean immediately something, but you can just do the same for the BCC. Just do the same, but just change FCC to BCC here and compute this. And it looks different from the, again, something, but different from the FCC. And just if we put them together in one plot, we just see that they're different. <coughs> Sorry. And this is basically the purpose of what we are doing. We want to have a representation that fulfills certain requirements that we listed and just able to distinguish different structure. And it seemingly does the job. FCC and BCC are different. So let us just increase the number of, of functions that we have here. And then we would have a picture like this. And this is basically nothing but the radio distribution function. It just, uh, what we do with this atomic centered symmetry function, we just probe uh, the radio distribution of an atoms and sum it with this, we probe it with some smooth function and acc accumulate it accordingly. And in the end, our descriptor is just a radio distribution function. And what we did is just to way of computing a radio distribution function. And same for BCC, and that's for the comparison. So they look clearly different, but actually you would see that FCC and BCC at certain distance are very, uh, look very much the same. And so just to make sure that it works, we can uh, create different FCC also structures, but just with different volume assigning different lattice parameter and certain range, we would build a descriptor for this structure and see how that would be looking like. And again, we'll see that they are all different. So uh, we build something that is uh, according to our requirements. This is rotationally and translational and translational invariant because the only coordinates that we're using here are interatomic distances, so internal coordinates. They do not depend on, upon these rotations or translations. The distances between the atom do not change. It is also permutationally invariant, and that is achieved by summing the neighbors. So because of the summation, it doesn't matter in which order these neighbors are listed, they all contribute uh, in the end to some uh, accumulator function. And this function is able to produce us, to give us something that uh, that looks different for different structures. So exactly what we wanted. The only thing that is left is just 
uh, add some learning machinery to assign an energy to a, such a descriptor. Um, but that was just a two-body descriptor, basically. So we only considered the interaction of, of pair of atoms and, and never more. Uh, with a similar way, you can do the free body interaction. So considering free atoms. Now, having a central atom I, you not only consider the one atom uh, J from its neighborhood, but also some other atom K, and you compute the angle between all these atoms and multiply by this similar exponent, uh, which is scaled by these two interatomic distances between atom I and the atom K. Ij, Ik distance, and you multiply by two cutoff functions now for, for the, which depends from each of these individual distances that again make sure that you are all smooth and nice. It has the per additional couple of parameters. One is this psi. Um, that would be determining again the the width of our probe. So what what this function does basically comparing to the previous one. So just take a look how it looks like immediately and uh, discuss from there. Yeah. So here we just implement this, this function here, nothing fancy. And uh, for some particular parameter, at uh, cutoff distance and the range of the Xi parameters, we just build it in the range of angles. So here I, I insert directly angles. Uh, I not compute the angles as, 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 a, as a between two vectors of distances. I just here for the illustration, I insert the angle directly. We compute it and that's how it looks like. So again, this is just the probe, but now let me make it smaller. It's again a probe, but now instead of the distances, we probe the angles. And depending on the parameter psi, the, the bigger it is, the more narrow uh, the probing window. And the now having an angle, having this descriptor here, the closer it is the angle to zero, the larger contribution you get, and the bigger the psi parameter, the closer to the zero you have to get. So <clears throat> you, you get only contributions which are closer to zero on 360 degrees. But you see that it's symmetric around the, the full rotation. And uh, this is something that you can variate for a change. And also there, there, there is another parameter lambda here that can be either plus, plus one or minus one. So if you change that, you revert the function totally in a different way, and you start to probe the angles which are close at 180 degrees. And again, the parameter psi controls how close you have to be to the 180 degree to get a contribution. Basically building something like this, uh, as previously we, we build the, radio distribution function, this would build us an angular distribution function. Uh, so uh, these are these descriptors and there are a few variations of this as well, uh, this atom-centered symmetry function. So here I, I didn't put attention to it, but you have this indices here that used to be two, this five, and then you can imagine there are three, there are four, there are six and seven and whatnot. Uh, so there are a few of those, but they are all kind of share the same, the same problems and advantages. So what's the uh, advantages is that it is relatively simple. And relatively means that, I mean, it is undeniably simple because we just implemented it here and a few lines of code. So they can be difficult, but relatively simple in a way because there are was a, quite a few parameters that we were talking about the psi, the eta, and, and whatnot. And these parameters are introduced again a lot into the arbitrarity. 
that we talked about. So you have to build your descriptor somehow. So you have to choose, first of all, the number of these probes that you have. You have to choose these parameters for these probes. You have to stack them together and insert in some learning um, machinery for these descriptors, usually neural networks, and hope that you can do uh, the good fit. But if you want to make better, for example, so you would assume that you probably need giving a radio distribution function here, having a few uh, params. So you would probably see here that you don't need probably as much descriptors here because there is zero anyways. Probably you need something some more here because you have big density here and you want to describe it more accurately. But how do you know it in advance? And how do you choose exactly uh, these parameters? And Usually these parameters are hyperparameters, so you don't optimize them during the fitting procedure. So you just choose them and then you do the fit. And ideally you would have to choose then several sets of these parameters and do several fits and from them uh, try to cho choose what's the best. That inconvenient and quite arbitrary in a way. And that's basically one of the disadvantages that it has. Advantage again is local and size independent, exactly what we wanted. And this is again immediately a disadvantage that it is local because some interaction that might be spanning across the whole uh, <coughs> system, like colomic interaction, you are not accounting for them. Then you have to do it in a separate way somehow. Uh, the bigger disadvantage is that it only um, includes two and three body contributions. Uh, so the, the one that the radio distribution and the angular distribution. And moreover, the, these three body symmetry functions, uh, you have to explicitly list uh, three body terms. So the tri these triangles of atoms, you have to list all of them. So the actual explicit three body contributions. That is quite expensive in a way, and it's getting more expensive the, the, the larger cutoff you have. So this, com this grows combinatorially. For a given a neighborhood, you have a combination, the combinatorial combination of, of these triplets of atoms. Again, a few references to look at about this descriptor. And again, about the arbitrarity. So there is this, uh, I guess, famous picture, you might have seen it already before, that basically shows quite a few the structural descriptors that exist. They have some connections and so on not going to discuss it too much about, except a few things that one is here listed is the complete n-body uh, representation. And there are only a few of such, one, two, three, four. And uh, we now going to talk about the ACE descriptor here. And ACE stands for the atomic cluster expansion. Uh, so what it does, I guess I have a little bit short on time, so I skip this part a little bit and go directly here. Uh, so what we do with this atomic cluster expansion, we do the so-called density trick. So similar to what we have done just for the symmetry function, we define the neighborhood density of the atom in this way, but instead of some smooth function, we define with a delta function. And the other thing, this is the definition, we define it like this. First, second, we define a one particle basis function that would uh, depend on the entire atomic distances and the, the spherical harmonics of, um, the spherical harmonics, so the orientation of this, of this bond um, in some way. So this is spherical harmonics, this is clear, and this is some radial functions. And they are some radio functions. You can choose a variety of them. And then de defining this, we now projecting this uh, a neighborhood density onto this uh, basis functions that we've chosen that basically leads us to producing this some, something that we call atomic base. And that would be the summation across the neighbors of this um, one particle basis functions. I just can compressed here this index in here in one particular one. Uh, 
now after doing this that so that would produce our base function for just two bodies two body interactions taking products of this function we can produce an n body uh, uh, function basically n body contribution to our energy uh, or to property whatever we want to expand so many body contribution to the to the expansion by simply taking the products of, of this uh, atomic basis as many times as we want and picturely can, can be represented like this so this would be so our energy would be contribution of, of, of two body terms uh, directly summed together across the whole neighbor so immediately the whole um, atomic density in the region would be contributing then our free body term I would be just simply a product of two such densities, four body terms would be three body products, and so on and so forth. Uh, so the uh, the atomic centered symmetry function would be only limited to this. So the very much truncated expansion, and here we can easily extend it further. Also, uh, unlike the symmetry functions, to build a free body interactions you don't you don't have to explicitly uh, build the, the free body terms explicitly uh, com calculating the contributions from the triplets of atoms you only build it for a pairs and the higher body contributions are obtained by the product so there is another nice pictures that can represent how it works and why it works it's just a schematic representation but having this projections of the neighborhood density summed across neighbors and multiplying two of such you know getting not only the pair contribution but contributions of a higher order as well uh, the only thing is that these products are not necessarily rotationally invariant uh, because of this uh, spherical harmonics here so we have to make them rotational invariant and this is achieved by the fact that we're summing uh, across the uh, the m index of a spherical harmonic such that would only contribute that would only leave the contributions with the uh, zero angular momentum so that means that those which are rotational invariant that's achieved by summing with the um, appropriate klebsch gordon coefficients but <coughs> not too much details about that and then we can define some atomic property that would be simply an expansion in terms of of these basis functions with some expansion coefficients which are now our trainable parameters and then we can say that our energy is basically some function of this atomic densities of these atomic properties that we define like this and we can choose uh, multiple of them uh, again to the arbitrarity argument well, we can choose multiple of them and we, if we choose only one of them we can say that this is already our atomic energy and this phi i here and that would be a linear expansion so we can represent our energy as a linear expansion of basis functions and we can build as many basis functions of, of different orders as we want we for each order we can build as many functions that we want and, because, and that because we have a, basically this expansion is complete in a way so you can uh, go further as much as you want or is as required to uh, build the energy as accurately as possible in practice we however use a nonlinear function here which is just so-called the finis sinclair type it is a combination of two densities uh, one is the linear expansion and the other one is the square root of this uh, expansion here which allows for a, a better efficiency but again not too much about that and so this uh, expansion this this ace expansion allow us to build this some uh, descriptors that would uh, because of its completeness and because of the fact that the higher body contributions are built just from the uh spare bonds we can build a very efficient but then show and we can show that this is the, the which basically forms the parita front of many other potential basically 
meaning that it is the most accurate and the most the, and the fastest among the uh, the few. Anyway, so and then again, so that's basically the uh, the uh, the advantage of this representation that it has. It is a complete basis, meaning that unlike the, the previous, the, like the symmetry functions, for example, if you want to extend your representation, if you want to make it more detailed or something, how you do it, you don't have a particular guidance ap apart from your own experience. You, know, you want to have additional probe, say, uh, I want to make my descriptor larger. Where do you add it exactly? Which parameters do you choose? And so on. How do you add a next function, basically? There is no uh, definition of what the next function is. And that's the problem of, of non-complete representations. And for this one, it does not exist. There is always a next function that you can add naturally. And again, uh, this, this advantage that is local, but in a way, this is something, again, we want but uh, that uh, restrict us in, from descripting uh, some other long range interactions. But again, that just only means that they have to be taken care uh, separately. Again, a few references to look at for more details. And then there is just something and I want to uh, draw your attention is this uh, GitHub page here at ICAMS here that has the implementation of, of this of this uh, ace method here. Uh, so let us now do some fitting with the ace and then we would look at how the ace basis functions ace representation look like. So you've downloaded before in the beginning some data file. Uh, oh, what is it? Oh. Sorry about that. There is some version mismatch. That's because on your on the call up that you have there, there, um, there is different Python version, so I had to rearrange some things. Okay, so there is just some data file that's uploaded for you that contains some DFT calculations for a copper of different uh, lattice uh, structures, uh, the, the crystal structures, lattice parameters, volumes, and whatnot. So we can plot briefly um, something which is the volume per atom for the structures that we have and the energy per atom. And it's something energy corrected. So basically energy that we have here, a cohesive energy, these are the FHI AIMS calculations. So it's a full electron code, so it has much bigger energy. So it is normalized by the uh, energy of an isolated atom. So producing a um, cohesive energy. And that's the, the structures that we have there. So they are just one electron volt above the, the minima here. And it contains the scaling with the volume, uh, the crystal structure, they are shaking. So atom moved a little bit around. And there are some structures with higher volume, so there are probably some um, open surfaces. So now what you have to do is then here on the collab, just simply running uh, this, uh, this commander that should start the, the fitting. Uh, yeah, this one uh, would just start for you and I will go somewhere else and do exactly the same, but in a different place. Um, what it does, it starts the pacemaker code that that runs the fitting of, of this potential with some config file. And meanwhile, while it does it, we just can have a look on the config file a little bit. Okay. So um, I have the screen now. Well, there are a few parameters that are similar to what discussed before, but also specific to a particular um, form of this expansion here. 
So the one is the cutoff here is the, again, this is the global cutoff for the cutoff function. So everything that inside contributes, everything outside do not contribute. Um, we define our elements here from this particular example that would be on the copper. Then embedding uh, this R, this function. So here we call this embedding function. And there are some uh, specification for this uh, embedding function. So we use this Finnish Sinclair type, which is the contribution of two densities, one linear, one square root. There are just some parameters of this, of this uh, density of, so basically there are two of them and some parameters of this, which basically saying that this is the linear and the square root. And those are not important for us at the moment. Then there is the bone section here that we have to specify that would uh, describe how we take care about the radio part of, of the of base, base function. There is this type of this radio basis because I mentioned that this function in particular can be whatever in principle of, of your likes. We, for example, use some Chebyshev polynomials or the linear combination of Chebyshev polynomials actually. Or in this particular case, this linear combination of, uh, of simplified spherical basal functions. Not particularly important. As I said, this part is again contributes to the arbitrarity a little bit. You can choose it according to your likes. Like, for example, you could choose the Gaussian functions uh, as in the previous example. Then the cutoff again, that might be different from the global one. It just again, this determines the, the sphere that we look up for the representing of the atoms, the type of the cutoff function, the core repulsion, that's something I didn't talk about, but uh, it's not particularly important. What is important is this section. So that one that determines the basis here, the one that determines the how deep we go into this product, and uh, basically how many times we multiply these functions together. And this described here, the first one would describe only the pair interactions. And that therefore, so that would be only this single uh, function here. Uh, just We just can choose a number of it. And again, unlike the previous example, that's it's a basis expansion. So you can just specify how many you want and it would be choosing the like the next one. So there is always a definition what's the next function is. And you can just select, I want to have this much. And if at some point you decide that you want more, you just put a bigger number and it would put a bigger number. And you don't have to select where this number have to go. Now, then in this list, the next order would, and basically here, it would be defining the N and L for the, the radio function and the L, the maximum L for maximum, the angular momentum for the uh, spherical harmonic function. And because this is only pair interaction, the doesn't have angular contribution, so it's zero. For a three body interaction, it, so it already contributes and we can select uh, the maximum N and maximum L here for the functions that uh, goes into the product here. So this would be three body order and would mean double product of this function with the maximum N3, maximum L2. That I just put these numbers and you can change them to anything. And again, if you decide at some point that you need a bigger basis, you just put a bigger number and it will produce the functions. That is very simple in this way. So the four body contribution and five body contribution very straightforward in a way. And here there is the, I have to specify the file name with the data and we did it already automatically uh, with the uploaded file. And then there is the something that concerns the fitting. I don't want to talk much about it because we don't touch the fitting problem. Basically the only parameter here that uh, determines the contribution uh, to the loss between the forces and the energy. And uh, because I didn't touch also any forces, I put here zero. That means that we only fit energy. We don't fit any forces. And method of optimization, how many steps we do. 
The other thing is um, that the uh, ACE basis allows, as can illustrate here, so we can, you can choose the trainable parameters. You can select which part you train, which part you don't. <coughs> this is in particular useful if you want to have a notice unary uh, compound representation, but some binary, say. And uh, this property of phase because of this delta function that we have. So delta is not only in the uh, radio department, but also in the chemical one. So we uh, distinguish function that are contribute from a particular combinations of pairs. Uh, and here uh, you can, in principle, combine different potentials. So say you have a representation that you trained for pure copper here, then you have some more data for aluminum, and then you have to have copper aluminum. You combine the two unary representations, and now you want to only learn the the, the binary one, and you can leave the unary untouched. Um, and then the other thing is that the completeness would allow is, is the continue, continuous grow of the, of the basis. So here we specify the maximum uh, and, and also basically the maximal size of our basis. We can select a very big numbers here, for example, and here, selecting the ladder step, we can do this so-called ladder fitting, the hierarchical fitting, where we could add the function one after another. So because again, of the basis, uh, you could choose which function is first, which one is second, and uh, you can add them by portions one after another, or like the, the, the few of them, like here five, for example, five, five one after another, and see how your um, description converges. And then at some point when you're satisfied with the uh, accuracy, say you can just, yeah, uh, say I'm fine and then and, and, and stop. So it not necessarily grow the basis. So again, unlike the previous representation would allow you some flexibility. Uh, so yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, so we are close to down to the end. So just here again, a uh, few words that there is one additional package that you install, there is the tensor potential that just does this fitting on the GPU basically. And that's would determine how many structures you do at once and et cetera, there are some technical parameters. For more details, you can again visit the this page here. And then there is a link for online documentation for all of this with the instructions and, and stuff that you can go through and try to see for yourself how it works and how to do it, how to use it for your particular example. Say, has some instruction on how to prepare these data sets that you now have at your hand, how to do it for your data and how to start the fitting and whatnot. So now, uh, okay, now I'm having troubles here, but anyways, you shouldn't be having them. Um, so what you see there is that's why well, some fitting in progress is that exactly um, how the the fitting procedure goes. Uh, so you start with some selected basis, and then the accuracy of your representation is very low, which is represented by this error here. But then the more you go, the, 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 the fitting goes, so you just get more and more accurate. This is some, some this is fine. But then at some point, you see that convergence stops and then you don't improve anymore. And then the, this hierarchical fitting steps in and it just basically says that, okay, I'm, I'm done with this and I'm extending the basis. So it used to be just the five basis functions. And then now it extended it to additional 10 because we selected the, the step to be five basis functions. And <coughs> you see, oh, sorry. And after that, adding, adding one, you immediately see that the convergence, uh, so, so the improvement started again up to until some point where it stops again, and then you have to add additional function. 
and so on. So it's already yeah, converged here. Then we stop and we add additional function and we start with the 15 now. And again, the convergence continues. Um, so, we produce some potential in the process that is, uh, so in the process of fitting, it produces a few files and basically contains the, this lot of steps potential, potentials that we kind of extending the basis and at each step of extending the basis, it saves the potential in these files. And this one contains the current representation. We can also quickly take a look on this one. So it has the information about all the basis functions. So it has the, 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 the pair contributions. So you see there's only uh, two copper atoms and the, this, the types of this interaction is only copper copper. We only have this one in the data. In principle, you could have here something copper, I know aluminum again, and something else. So the three body contributions. Now then the four body and the five body. And this here are the expansion coefficients that correspond to this particular basis function. And these are the N and L, which correspond to this basis function. Just some idea how the structure looks like of the, the potential, what it has inside. So this is basically literally a list of the basis functions with its parameters and the expansion coefficients. We can try to do something with this uh, potential. Uh, we can learn the, we can load the calculator that prepared for this and this basically the IC calculator for this potential. And we can do some computations. And again, let's set up some uh, copper FCC, uh, create some, and just let's compute the, the lattice parameter, basically do the Mernigel curve, right? you change, change the volume and continuously compute the volume and the energy with this, this potential and see what we get. And this predicts so the lattice parameter 363 which is again, very close to a PBE DFT value. So we did pretty good job. Yes, we can also do this for the uh, PCC copper and also get a value which is reasonably close. We can combine this curves for two phases and did we see something that we expected? Copper is the FCC material, so it's low in the energy than the PCC. And uh, we can just quickly look at the basis functions, what the A's produces. Basically, how uh, you can access them when you create the structures, and then you set the, this calculator there and perform the computation. Then the calculator has the attribute projections, which are basically the basis functions for these structures. Uh, the shape of that would be because I created the two by two by two supercell, it would contain 32 atoms with 65 basis functions. And for each of the atom, there would be the 65 basis functions. And we can just take a look at them. And they have no particular information by just looking at them. <coughs> Simply because that, that's somehow the difference between the, the atomic symmetry function, because they are somehow intuitive and illustrative. You can look at them, you could see what means, and that's also the reason why I show them. You can really kind of, uh, the, the meaning of them is quite visual. The meaning of these projections are not so meaningful, just by looking at them by eyes, you can't really tell the difference, except it tells you about some symmetry, because you would see that some functions have uh, zero or close to zero uh, values, and the close to zero simply because I put some uh, random noise in the positions. If they would be completely perfect, all these functions would be. Okay, let me just try to do this. Yep, see that these values would be completely zero. That meaning that this is just it, they are somehow the only thing that you could see from here is that they resemble the symmetry. These functions are zero simply because they are zero by symmetry. And having them, you kind of incorporating the symmetry description there. But if you break the symmetry, these functions start to have values 
and that they will start to have contribution to energy with the corresponding expansion coefficient. That basically ensures the accuracy that you could reach. And so, but I guess that's that's could be the end of it. And thank you very much for your attention. If any questions, I guess you could ask now or afterwards. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Anton, for the ex exceptional tutorial, very clear and detailed, and going through all of the majorly used descriptors in machine learning. Uh, for time constraints, we're going to end this now and have a coffee break, but I'm sure Anton will be happy to answer your questions one on one. And uh, also remember that the, the Collab notebook is accessible to you, and there will be a recorded version on this going online. So we now have a coffee break and we start again at 11 with Amilica Todorovic on kernel methods. Thank you very much. <laughs>